some people just come in and they're like, I'm only going to syndicate. And I'm not a huge fan of that. I mean, I, I know it can be great. You can make a ton of money, but like, I really like to diversify and have multiple streams and multiple things going on. Cause you know, everything, you know, falls apart. You still got the ones you own and you still know how to buy for yourself. And so setting it up like that for the long run, I think is really, really critical. Welcome to the Real Estate Podcast. Nick, appreciate you being here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah, it's we try to make it really relaxed, easy going, uh, try to provide value however we can to listeners, and at the same time, what I always talk about is Alex and I get to sit here and learn, and uh, you know, it's always fun. So thanks for coming. We met a while ago, I feel like, maybe three or four years, yeah, if I'm right. Yeah, maybe like three years ago i think radio or uh was it no it was uh, um buzz mill buzz mill yeah yeah we met at buzz mill yeah do you remember how we got connected did you reach out to me or did i reach out to you i think uh i reached out to you on bigger pockets oh right on yeah that was about the time when i was just trying to meet everybody in austin real estate so yeah, yeah. you've come a long way so you I, remember, I guess you hadn't really done much at that point for real estate no, I mean, I had, yeah, just, just single family stuff. I had a duplex. I had a few single families under my belt, but that was it. Nice. Yeah. So now Nick is uh, doing some big apartment deals, and we'll get into that. But would love, because uh, I, I can't remember exactly what your job was, but you had a job for a while, and uh, you put in the time, and then you got into real estate. But if you could walk us through your background, like where you grew up, kind of what you've done and, and where you're at now and we'll just jump in and ask some questions yeah yeah i'll try and be concise because it's not a super unique story but um i am from denver born and raised denver i moved out to austin about seven years ago okay um when we were having our first kid so my wife's family is all out in austin so we moved down here uh and it's been great you know i, I like austin it's a great city um but you know, for 11 years, uh, I have been in the automotive industry. So I started at Volkswagen as a, as a porter uh, while in college, and then I ended up transitioning to just, you know, a uh, failed engineer, dropped out and started doing the mechanic stuff and actually went to trade school for that because um, I found I enjoyed it. So I did that for 11 years, started at Volkswagen, worked there <clears throat> until I was master technician. Um, yeah, that's, and, and that's, I mean, master technician's legit. Yeah, For yeah. people that don't know, I mean, that's not easy to get. No, it was cool. It was cool. Um, I enjoyed, you know, I, I really liked the, the job. It's challenging. It was, you know, different every day. Uh, and then I went to work at Audi for a while as well. Um, but you just reach a, a, a cap in earnings, right? I mean, anybody familiar with mechanics, you pay flat rate. And so I was getting paid really well and making a lot of hours, but it got to the point where the only way I was going to make more is if I slept at the shop right and i had a family and kids and that's when i kind of explored investing because i was making money how does that work as far as uh i mean is it just like a standard you know keep up with inflation type raise every year how does that uh it depends so if you're if you're good and you work for a good company you know they usually recognize that you're doing a lot um and so you get raises kind of you know as you progress through the ranks so at least the way Volkswagen does it, there's like engine specialists, transmission specialists. You need to go to the classes, you know, mm. learn, and then as they see your hours and, and your, you know, your fixed right first times and all your KPIs improving, um, you can start demanding a higher rate. Got it. So for the most part, you're, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 hours a week, busting it, and you felt like there was somewhat of a cap and you enjoyed it, but you wanted more freedom is probably what it was yeah more freedom um you know at, at that point i was just trading all my time for money mm -hmm. right so there's there's no out there um it was do this for 60 years and then you know it's hard on the body so uh, by the time you retire it's like you're you know you're decrepit and you just kind of sit in the corner i guess until you die so yeah. I, I didn't want that right that's a hard job it's a good skill though yeah no I, I, like i said it was fun i, yeah. I enjoyed it so fast forward, you're syndicating larger apartment deals. 
you've done, I don't know, five deals to however many deals. Um, would love to kind of hear, how did you get, I mean, you jump right into syndicating, right? Like, uh, is that correct? Uh, kind of. Uh, so like I said, I had, I, uh, had some single family stuff under my belt. Um, and then I had done a 12 unit with some people in mm. Atlanta. Okay. Um, then I bought the Austin deals and that was actually just me and my partner uh, in that structure. So mm. syndicating came later. Okay. The deal we're doing right now, that's a syndication. What, uh, what attracted you to more units? Um, you know, I got to a point where I was realized I liked real estate. You know, I liked and at first it was just a vehicle. And then the more I did it, I was like, this is fun. How do I do this full time? And so I was kind of looking at what we were doing, which was buying, you know, a single family home or two single family home rentals every year and realized it would take me forever to get to the point where I could do this full time. Um, and then also it, was, it, it just came down to an effort thing, you know, especially in Austin at the time, uh, it was hard to find single family rent, even duplex deals that made any sort of sense, you know, unless mm -hmm. you're just neutral or even paying you know extra or putting down like 50 percent or whatever you had to do to make it work but mm -hmm. um and so as i looked at the time and effort it would go into to finding a good deal and then you know finding more deals so we can grow a little faster it's like i'm gonna put all this effort in to close a few more single families it just didn't make sense so that's kind of when it got back to like well why don't i look at larger units mm -hmm. what was that process uh, as far as just like learning because it's all you didn't have a great understanding at that point, right? It was all brand new. Yeah. Yeah. Super brand new. Um, I'd been listening to bigger pockets for years. So I'd probably listen to their podcast. Um, 2014 is when I started listening to them. And then, you know, I've probably read, you know, all the books everybody reads on real estate and mm -hmm. business. And, um, so I had a primer and I had an idea, but when it got down to like, okay, where do I actually go from here? Like, what's the first step, right? Like everybody gets the concepts of real estate. Like, you know, buy low, fix it up, sell high, you know, and then in between there's a bunch of how, right? Um, and so I had to reach out to, uh, I, I joined a mentorship group because I was just like, I, you know, I get the concept. I just need the the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. And that was, was that the Jake and Gino? Yeah, yeah that was Jake and okay. Gino. And at that point, had you already bought the couple deals that were pretty much the ones that you owned, the smaller ones? Uh, no. So at that point it was just, you know, I just had the single families and duplexes under my belt. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, man. So tell us if you can, cause it's super exciting. Like what, what you've accomplished, like what you've bought and accomplished. And cause I don't, I actually don't know. I know, I think one of the deals, but I, I think you've done more, but can you tell us like, like, uh, when you close it total units and like where you're at now? Yeah. Um, so, you know, Moving from single family to larger stuff, the first deal I closed was a, a 12 unit, uh, and that was in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, and that was with just a bunch of uh, uh, people, uh, like a joint venture kind of thing. I'm actually a smaller part of that because it's in Atlanta. I couldn't really offer too much value there, but it was a it was a good experience. Did you find that one? No. <clears throat> what no, did What did you like? What What value did you bring? Uh, to that like why were you part of that were you was it capital or the underwriting like what got you there yeah part of it was capital um you know i contributed some capital to it uh some of the due diligence stuff you know we all help out on asset management stuff because it's you know four or five of us in a 12 unit so we we spread it out as thinly as we can but at the end of the day that's a lot of people in a deal right um that small yeah uh, but it was good it was a learning experience you yeah know, and it kind of got me got my feet wet and got started so, so you got a local property manager yeah you and three other partners and y'all just have that as a long-term hold yep for the most part yep cool yeah it's been a good property i mean you know yeah i don't know anything about that market but yeah i, I don't either so that's kind of why i stopped buying there <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. 12 units sounds great though yeah yeah no i mean like you got to trust your partners in that respect so mm -hmm. I, you know i did and it worked out well but um and then you know while we were closing that one is when i was looking really heavily in austin uh, that's about the time we met actually uh, a little bit before that but uh, and so you know we'd be looking at deals making offers not really getting any traction uh, and then finally we got an offer accepted which was a 53 unit here in Austin uh, down by uh, Riverside yep um, so we closed that July 2019 okay yeah Real, real quick for yeah. for someone who you know maybe looking into getting into apartment syndication so you're going through this mentorship program you're learning you know 
the nuts and bolts of what exactly to do and how to do it. And so while you're going through this program, you and others have, I guess, did you maybe find people in that program to partner with or? Yeah. So everybody in that 12 unit was from that program. Gotcha. And so y'all started focusing on Austin and then um, as you're still in the program, you're just making offers, underwriting deals, looking for deals and seeing if one lands or? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we had our range that we were looking at, you know, it was, it was basically like 20 to 100 uh, in Austin. Um, and so anything that really popped up in that in that range or that was brought to us, you know, we were touring, underwriting and seeing if we could make it work, you know, if it fit what we were looking for. And are you full time uh, mechanic still at this point? Or? Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, walk in properties on Saturday and Sunday or? Yeah, I mean, you know, go on your lunch break. Uh, you know, we got a day off during the week if we worked on Saturday. So I worked a lot of Saturdays to kind of and put all my tours on, you know, like a like a Wednesday. I mean, you'd be as flexible as you can. Right. Yeah. Sweet. So. Um, all right. So y'all found the a 53 unit deal near mm-hmm. Riverside. Yeah. And what when was this? Uh, we found this, I mean, it was earlier 2019, uh, about a, I think we ended up doing a 75 day close. So closed in July, so a few months before that. Nice. Yeah. And, and go ahead. I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, buying real estate in Austin, especially on Riverside. Mm. Was did you feel like, I mean, I know you analyzed it, but did you feel a little nervous? Like, I'm sure you didn't get it at a steal. I'm sure you got a good deal, but like. You're like, man, we're this is this is the big leagues now. We're kind of stretching for something. Is that? Kind oh of, yeah, 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 yeah. I was super nervous. What yeah. was just so people understand? Like when you say underwriting, uh, and you don't have to go through all of it, but like um, kind of a quick kind of you know one through five or whatever it is. What does that look like? How do you start the process of underwriting? Do you start after you identified a property that you're really interested in, and and can you walk us through the basics of that? Yeah, um, it's definitely evolved over time. So now, you know, now that I know my market's a lot better, you know, we can kind of shortcut a few processes like looking at the neighborhoods and such because we already really know, you know, what we're getting into. But, you know, starting out, a lot of it is, you know, what what's the size of the deal? I'll kind of like glance at the financials and rent roll because most of the stuff now we're getting is first looks. So you're not seeing a lot of OMs and all, you know, all pretty pictures and things like that. You're saying most of the deals you're looking at now are the brokers calling you before other people have looked at it. Is that right? Yeah, and I, and they're not really calling me. I don't know if it hit that level yet. I'm just reaching out, and now they at least know I can close. So we're getting some first looks before they've like put everything together. Got it. But it's all on us to follow up. It's not like they're calling me saying, hey, I got this sweet deal. Are they like, um, do you feel like they're testing the waters? Or if you were pretty serious, they, they'd let you make a run at the deal? Yeah, they definitely let us make a run. I mean, we bought uh, the second deal that way. Okay. Um, and the third deal, actually, uh, we got a first look at as well. Uh, some of the time, though, I would say the bulk of the time when you get those first looks are when they don't have the exclusive yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a lot of testing the water, right. and it's you know sometimes it's time waste, but you got to you got to take the shot. Yeah. So understand the neighborhoods, understand the general market. Yeah. Yeah, Makes we're looking sense. at crime. Uh, you know, first because we don't want to buy a property that has high crime, uh, which is a headache that we don't want to deal with. Um. And then, you know, there's other things going wrong, like insurance and things like that. Um, when it gets to the actual underwriting of the, you know, looking through the financials and stuff, I mean, that's a pretty in-depth process. Yeah, and I've seen his, I've seen your underwriting and it's amazing because I did that in, in uh, A&M, mm. but like I'd never really messed with that outside of that. And it is super detailed and yeah. there's a lot. You got to see some of these spreadsheets. I, I think you have a deal right now, right? Yeah. Uh, so maybe you can look at that, but... Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, that's in my opinion, like where the the biggest value comes from, kind of what you're doing. Yeah, the way I view it. Yeah, I think you know people think underwriting, like oh, I put the numbers into the spreadsheet and I looked at some rent comps and apartments.com, and then we're good to go. You know, we know what we can do. But it's in my opinion, it's way more involved than that. You really got to like go shop all those rent comps, see what they're getting. You know, compare it to the ones that you're looking at. Um, you you know you're building this huge document. Uh, this huge business plan. I mean, you're, you you got to be as detailed as you can be and, you know, realize on day two, a lot of that flies out the window, but you still want to have your plan in place, you know? Oh, right. after day, after you close. Yeah. After you close <laughs> a lot of, a lot of your assumptions change. What right? would you but, say? Like when you put a full, you know, underwriting packet together, uh, how much time would you say that, that you've probably put into that? 
if I get to the point where I feel like, hey, this is a deal I want to buy, um, and you know, or at least it looks interesting, right? I've done my initial underwriting, which now takes about 20, 30 minutes just to see, okay, I think we can be competitive mm-hmm. on it. And we've toured the property and we like what we saw and we're making offers, you know, we're getting to the making offers stage. Um, I, you know, it, it can be a really in-depth project depending on how, you know, by the book it is. Are um, you doing the majority of your underwriting uh, after you put it under contract or before? No, definitely before. But definitely I mean, before. are you saying, I mean, the way I perceive it, you probably got 30 hours into that uh, underwriting. Is that accurate? Um, it's pretty close, yeah. Uh, I would say initial underwriting, you know, 20 minutes to an hour. Uh, by the time we're making offers, we've probably put five or six hours into it. And as we're closing, you know, we're putting way more right. uh, due diligence into the mm-hmm. to the underwriting. But, you know, we're not really fluctuating. At that point, we kind of have our price. And yeah. We know like what we can do. Now it's just really drilling it as specific as we can. Yeah, I mean, it's it's and what's interesting to me is it's just a lot of work because – at least um, some of the people I know that are doing these deals, they get the call for offers. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you you got to just go out there and be competitive with all these other people knowing there's a small chance you're going to get it. But you have a massive amount of time and commitment up front. But that's part of the game. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a lot of time. I wouldn't say time wasting because you learn something on every deal and you improve your process. But I mean, our, the last deal we closed in Austin was 2019 December. And so we had a few going into the pandemic that fell out because, you know, it was like March and April when they were. I remember you talking about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but between, you know, March and, and now the, the deal we have under contract, I mean, there was a bunch of no's, you know, a bunch of time spent underwriting and touring. And it's just kind of, you know, prices are going one way and rents are going the other way. So it's, it's been an interesting market. Yeah. And uh, the, I guess, are you looking only in Austin? Or are you looking everywhere? Um, pretty much only in Austin. Now we've expanded, you know, a little bit. We've looked, um, pretty much the whole MSA and we're starting to get a little more Southern into like Mm -hmm. San Antonio, um, New Braunfels area. And it becomes pretty small market, right? Like you probably, probably know most of the multifamily brokers at this point. And is, are you doing a lot of, um, off market, like deals that brokers don't have that you're, you're cold calling or sending mailers, anything like that? No. We haven't really done too much of that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, you know, f- from our standpoint, it's been a much more effective use of time to leverage the broker's relationships with all these sellers, sure. um, especially because in the size we're looking at, it's usually a more sophisticated seller. Um, you know, it might still be like mom and pop, but they know like, hey, I'm going to do a, like a marketing on this because that's how I'm going to get the best price. You know, mm-hmm. we haven't found too much opportunity in, in the off market. We've had... You know, off-market deals brought to us from brokers, but that's you know, right. not the same. Fascinating thing. what brokers know. Like mm-hmm. they always have all these owners that they know and stuff in their back pockets, and you talk to the right ones, and they know a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so you did the was it fifty three on yeah. Riverside? What came next? Yeah, as we were closing the fifty three, um, we were kind of looking at management and trying to figure out how we were going to run it. Mm-hmm. And one thing we realized is, hey, we need to find another property nearby. You know, as soon as possible to consolidate management so we can have a full-time manager and a full-time maintenance tech on those two properties. Um, and so we were looking, and this is the off-market one it was brought to us by a, a broker out here in Austin and it was a 71 unit. Mm-hmm. And so we, we started, you know, we went under contract on that before we closed the 53 and we ended up closing that one, uh, October, 31st actually I think 2019 okay and then yeah. that gave you that efficiency of having them together yeah nice. yeah that helped a ton what returns are y'all looking for for uh, apartments here in Austin yeah so it definitely depends uh, on how we're gonna take it down right if it's just me and my partner uh, we're way more flexible uh, on what we're looking for and you know our exit strategies and how much we're gonna put into it on the front end um, if we're looking at it from a syndication that's a different standpoint I mean, typically we're looking at five to seven year holds. We want to hit, you know, a two X equity multiple in that time. If it's, uh, you know, Mark and myself, we're personally not too concerned about cash flow. You know, like huge amounts of cash flow because we're usually reinvesting that back into the property to lower our equity on the front end. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't do that in syndications. That's a hard model to sell. So we're raising a little bit more. Um, 
on that to, to fund the renovations. So, you know, we're looking at average cash on cash over seven years, I would say six to seven percent. Uh, it's not the biggest driver of growth in this market, right? It's all the value add. So, right. That, that's what I was curious about. So, about six, seven percent cash on cash return. Um, and when y'all are buying these properties, typically are they cash loan day one, or when yes. do y'all? Yeah. 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 I, I, I don't yet have the stomach to buy anything that doesn't cash flow day one. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I'm not too concerned. You know, the difference between like you know four and six percent day one to me. Uh, you know, I mean, we're looking at it at a non i you know interest only basis because we want to you know you're going to come out of that uh but still it, it's more important to have consistent cash flows than you know for like for the returns we're looking for than super strong cash flows in this market right uh another thing i think uh would be beneficial too is to hear your explanation uh and definition on what uh apartment syndication is i was talking to one of our partners this weekend who's very experienced in real estate. And I don't know if he was just uh, kind of picking at uh, the question, but he was like, how would you define, you know, apartment syndication? Like he didn't know. And so um, for our viewers who may not know uh, what apartment syndication is, how would you define and, and explain kind of what you do there? Yeah, I think the way, and I'm obviously not an attorney or anything like that. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. But um, when I think of apartment syndication, I think it's, you know, uh, you have active sponsors, people running the deal, and then you have people investing it that, you know, you have no expectation that they are going to be involved in the day-to-day -day, day -day operations or choices that are being made. Um, you know, they're passive, usually silent investors. Um, I know, like, there's definitely things in, in the real estate world where that exists that's not a, a syndication, uh, but probably technically is, you know, if you look at it from the, the Howey test method. Um, but it's, you know, uh, I guess that's the best way to describe it. And so you're putting these deals together, you're raising money, and then uh, you are you and your partners are the GPs. Correct. General partners. And y'all are the ones running the operations, making the decisions, distributing cash flow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, taking on the debt. Um, and then you've got your passive investors who y'all raise money from that are just investing in the deals that fund the entire operation. Correct. Yeah. Right. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. And, and you probably know about this, but we, I just learned it the other day. We had a guy, do you know Ben Kogut by chance? Uh, the name sounds familiar. He's, he does like uh, retail buildings and shopping center syndications. Hmm. And he was talking about the, you know, one thing I'm really trying to zone in this next year is the tax advantages of real estate and yeah. how you can do, you know, you can obviously depreciate the asset and get those benefits for the investors. But what he was saying was if certain investors don't want that or don't need that depreciation for whatever reason, then that can spread out to the rest of the investors. Yeah. You already you knew that. Yeah, you can, you know, de uh, depreciation is, is shared, you know, pro rata, but you can, you know, sell off your depreciation that's, if you don't need it. That's massive. I mean, for example, like uh, a self-directed IRA or uh, an out of country investor, you know, they don't need the depreciation. And so I guess they were splitting it up between the other investors. Yeah. It's it's weird to me because I mean that's a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean if you if if Alex and I were to invest in one of your deals, and nobody wanted the, the depreciation, and we could get all of that, it's massive. I mean it, yeah. it makes our you know I don't know how to exactly calculate what the re our return is, but it's definitely higher. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's just a really interesting concept that's kind of new to me. Yeah, I mean it's good for people who uh you know maybe don't need the depreciation there's a lot of people who do and it's definitely a huge wealth building aspect but you know uh it's just another thing you could trade it for more equity or cash flow or whatever you want to do you know yeah so i mean you've uh you've come a long way um you know mindset wise like were you kind of are you kind of surprised that at what how things have turned out um did the real estate industry obviously it's been good to you but uh and i know you put in a lot of work but has it kind of shocked you at, at how far you've come? Because um, I feel like very few people have done that that quickly. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I I think uh, you know I've been blessed with the people I've met and the partners that I have, which has definitely helped kind of accelerate the growth. Mm -hmm. um, All about the people, right? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'm not a strong you know people person, not a great networker, but I I tell that to everybody who's getting started is like you got to meet you know, talk to everybody you can, 
Well, yeah, you did it. I mean, you yeah. you met you reached out to me, which is rare because I'm usually the one reaching out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but that yeah, it seemed like that's what you were doing is mm -hmm. uh, making your rounds, getting your name out there. Yeah, I mean that's that's what you got to do, uh, in my opinion, especially in a in a if you're getting into like multifamily because it is it's a team sport. You know, you got to have people on your team. Mm -hmm. um, and what also what's really cool is that you're syndicating but you're also buying for yourself mm -hmm. you're you're flexible and creative with it where some people just come in and they're like i'm only going to syndicate and i'm not a huge fan of that i mean I, I know it can be great you can make a ton of money but like i really like to diversify and have multiple streams and multiple things going on because you know everything you know falls apart you still got the ones you own and you still know how to buy for yourself and so setting it up like that for the long run i think is really really critical yeah it when I started, I was, wasn't looking to syndicate at all. You know, I just wanted to buy something larger, you know, and, and come together with a few people on it. So mm -hmm. it, it's just another tool in the tool belt. You know, I think if you can take it down, uh, you know, joint venture partnership, you can do a tick with somebody 1031. -ing. I mean, you could, you can close these deals whatever way you want. Just, yeah, you gotta be flexible. Yeah, absolutely. How, how many of y'all syndicated so far? Uh, so we have two active syndications, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, we have the one under contract right now. Uh, th 72 three. units right now? Or yes. 73? 72. 72, yeah. New Braunfels? Yes. Nice. Congrats, man. Thank you. Yeah. So two in LA. Yeah. And then one in New Braunfels that's under contract. Yes. And then um, the ones here in Austin, like I guess off Riverside, just you and your partner bought that one? Yeah, those were all through partnerships. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And... Um, what is the the plan moving forward? Do y'all uh, are y'all looking at bigger and bigger deals? Are you still planning on syndicating apartment complexes? Any interest in any other areas? Um, we've been looking at bigger and bigger deals. You know, we we have the the ability to go larger now, which is fun and exciting. You know, we made uh, some offers on you know two hundred plus and one hundred and eighty plus uh, recently, uh, so it'd be cool to do those. But we're still looking. You know, anything. Uh, really, I would say 20 to 100, depending on, I mean, 20 to 200 now, I guess, depending on where it's located. I mean, there's neighborhoods in Austin that I love uh, and we already own it. So you know, I would buy a 10 unit down the block if it made sense. You know, you just. Right. Could... What's the earnest money check look like on a 200 unit deal? Um, the earnest, yeah, it, it depends. You could do, you know, typically it's like 1% when you start getting that high. Um, we've found that you know when we can't be as competitive on price mm -hmm. um well a lot of it's reputation you don't want to be a retrader but you know going in with higher earnest money mm -hmm. um shorter due diligence or you know terms that work so you can still make the price work mm -hmm. so right. um i guess moving forward the plan is just keep it rolling mm -hmm. obviously the 72 units probably front of your mind get that closed right yeah and then just keep buying more real estate yeah, yeah yeah i mean uh, i like it it's fun it's yeah. you know uh it's challenging and uh rewarding so you and your partners uh that you met uh, with the in the mentorship program um had they syndicated any deals before had they bought any apartment complexes uh the partners that i met in the in the 12 unit uh i guess the ones that you you know met around then and and have stayed with and continued just to be clear i i think you only have one partner for the, for the all the other stuff for all the other stuff Those gotcha. four was one time and then he's got one guy that yes correct okay yeah and so um this guy uh did where'd you meet this guy at uh bigger pockets okay yeah sweet and was yeah. he already buying apartment complexes or yes. syndicating deals yeah so he's been doing it for 20 plus years Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question was going to be is, you know, uh, since getting started, have y'all kind of dialed in the systems now to where, you know, y'all can uh, just start, you know, analyzing deals as frequently as possible. And as soon as you get one, uh, it's just a, a systems procedure moving forward and y'all can go on to the next one. And are they kind of dialed in? Are y'all still working through things or? I mean, I think we're always adapting our processes, you know, as we go through and find things that work better or didn't work the last time. But yeah, definitely. I mean, we're big systems people, or at least I am. Uh, I like having like a checklist that we go down so we don't miss any steps. Mm -hmm. um, Are you looking to bring people on and build out a team or just? Yeah. 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 We've, uh, we like adding, I mean, it, it depends, you know, you really got to find somebody who compliments 
uh, the current team, mm -hmm. you know, without too much overlap mm -hmm. because everybody, especially at this size in our little business, you wear a lot of hats, right? Mm -hmm. So there's always some overlap, but you still want somebody who adds a lot of value. So yes, but it's, uh, you gotta be specific. What about. do you have that in mind? Like what, what that person, uh, what skill sets they would have? Like, yeah, we, we kind of chatted about this before, uh, we started, but social media, you okay. know, it's such a hard, you know, investor management, um, uh, investor relations, investor type. relations, yeah. you know, the social media fundraising aspect of it. Like we have our key partners and, and, you know, people that we, you know, have invested with us before and are comfortable with us. And we grow that kind of organically, mm -hmm. but having that arm of, of the syndication company built out so we can, you know, transact, you know, bigger and bigger and more and more deals. Yeah. Um, would be very helpful. What are you, you hear what that? Are you, <laughs> there you go yeah what are your thoughts on uh the social media strategy to attract investors i mean i think it's powerful if you do it right i mean look at there's you know a lot of people out there um you know big names that raise a lot of money that way and attract a lot of people you know they leverage uh even you know instagram facebook linkedin is a big one um and you know it, it works out well for them so just to go out there kind of get y'all's name and y'all's brand established and just reach uh you know high net worth individuals that want to place their money somewhere yeah i think it's just all about getting your story out there getting your brand out there and then just being you know why are you unique and putting your own unique voice on it so we've we've tried to do that ourselves i'm not a strong social media person um but then also tried outsourcing it and that's really tough because it's hard for somebody else to to do your message, you know, mm -hmm. to do the message the way you want it to do. Right. So, and they can't be you, you yeah. know? Yeah, exactly. Well, what's also, but what's cool about it. And I think you, you know, you have the foundation, like the social media is the, uh, the appeal, right. But you have the, the building blocks and, and you can go figure that out. And then once you do, you start getting it out there, it becomes a really small world. I, like quickly people just really start picking up on who you are. Mm. Uh, but my advice, and it's just like with us is find the right person, which, yeah. you know, Andrew is that for us and we just kind of let him run with it, you know, but it's been really, really good. But at the same time we're putting in the work where a lot of people are out there just only doing social media and then maybe trying to build it on the, yeah. after that, you know? Yeah. It's tough. I mean, social media takes a long time. So well, you start putting time and you're like, well, I don't got time to do deals, which is how I actually make money. It's a full-time job. I mean, yeah. like we have to sit down for hours and record podcasts and I have to go home and, and edit all this stuff. Yeah. Or when Andrew's here, it's, you know, we have to put it in our schedule to, to go and record content or, you mm -hmm. know, go drive around for the vlog or whatever. I mean, it's, it's a full-time deal, yeah. you know? But it does pay in, in dividends and it does, you know, get your name out there. And, and we've seen a lot of success from it. Yeah. Yeah. We have a podcast that's been going for a little while now. Uh, and it's just finally people are starting to be like, oh, I listen to your episode. And, you know, about 10. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Someone's actually listening, you know. But yeah, that took a ton of time. What's your podcast called? Uh, the Wild West Real Estate Show. Wild West Real Estate Show. And yeah. where, where can people find it at? Uh, everywhere. I mean, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, any, anywhere you consume podcasts, it's there. Do you do the distribution of that or do you have somebody who uploads it to all those platforms? Oh no, that's me. Yeah. What do you use to get it on all those platforms? Uh, Libsyn. Libsyn? Yeah. L-I-P-S-O-N? L-I-B-S-Y-N. L-I-B-S-Y-N. Yeah. It's just like a platform that you can connect to all those things yeah. and upload at once and... Yeah, it's just our, our hosting, podcast hosting site. Sweet. You we like need it. I want to well, see you like, all right. It says LinkedIn three minutes ago, Facebook two minutes. I'm like, he's going through each one, putting these on there. No, I do it via something like that. But ours currently is just getting uploaded to YouTube. When Andrew was here, um, the audio would get uploaded to iTunes, Spotify, yeah. you know, so on and so forth. Um, and I don't know what he was using to do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So we use uh, Libsyn for all the audio. And then if we, you know, and then to get into the social media aspect, we use uh, social monials and just, you know, post one and it goes to all of them. Nice. Yeah. Sweet. Any of the listeners know any uh, other tips? Let us know. Yeah. Please. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. Well, what are ways that, um, you know, we can add value or listeners can add value? I, I think I understand the goals move forward, buy more yeah. real estate, which yeah. is always good. Um, anything you, you need help with right now? Are, are you able to, I don't, 
I don't understand fully the uh, capital raising side of things. Are you able to talk about the deal? And, and yeah, no, I can't. You're not. Yeah, it's, yeah. I don't understand that world. Um, yeah. You have to have a prior relationship with somebody. Is that how? It- yeah. Yeah. It's all based on, I mean, I guess what filing you're doing. So there's one where, you, you know, a 506 C uh, where you can advertise anywhere. You can put on Facebook, right? But you can only accept accredited investors and they have to be certified, you know, not self-certified. They mm-hmm. can't just say I'm accredited. Someone's got to vet that. Mm-hmm. Um, or a 506 B, which is where you have to have a, you know, a pre-existing sub- substantive relationship. And I know about, you know, I know our investors and where they're at and their financial literacy and, you know, all of that. But I can't speak about it on podcasts and put it on Facebook. Or gotcha. Go to a meetup and stand in front of the room. So with a 506C, you could do that. Uh, and then obviously, you know, accept your friends or previous relationships uh, to invest your deal as well, right? Uh, you can as long as they're accredited. Yeah. They have to be accredited. Yes. In 506B, they don't have to be accredited. Correct. Gotcha. And so that's why y'all go the B route? Yes, and also for the accredited accredited investors, um, the certification process is a lot easier. Nice. What was the uh, so you got a PPM right? That yeah. Once somebody's interested, you send that to them. Yep. My understanding that you get an attorney and it's fifteen twenty grand to put all that together. Is that yeah. accurate? Yep. Yeah, they draw up all your subscription docs and go through your business plan and. You know, make sure everything's spelled out for your investors. So they know, you know, what happens if this happens. You know, what happens if the sponsor gets hit by a bus? Who takes, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Because you want to know what happened. You know, the scenarios. Yeah. Well, and just so everyone's clear, uh, buying it is always probably the easy part, and then running it and managing it and yeah. operating it is where the work comes in, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And, and you're using third-party management, but you're doing asset management, Correct. basically overseeing the property manager. Yes. Yep. Right on. Well, yep. I'm excited for you, man. Um, so for the listeners, if you can, uh, one more time about your podcast. Guys, if you want to uh, hear about his deals in the future, reach out so you can have a, uh, a meeting beforehand, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that valuable for you? You wanna, yes. want people to yeah, reach definitely. out to Nick? Um, definitely. Great guy and doing some cool deals. Uh, but yeah, what are ways people can get a hold of you and anything else you want to talk about, please lay it out. Yeah, sure. So the podcast... Um, you know, it's the Wild West Real Estate Show. Uh, we've actually had you know Matt on there, so definitely check that episode out. But we've got, we've had some other big name guests as well. Um, easiest way to get in contact with me, it's just you know my name Nick N I C K at quantumcapitalinc.com. Quantumcapitalinc.com, which, which is our website. You know, you can hear all about our our past deals. You know, look at you know register to talk and see any of our upcoming stuff and uh we also host the podcast there as well so you were doing a meetup right yes and yeah off because of the pandemic so we did transition if you're you know if you're on facebook we it's the the south texas multifamily and more group mm-hmm. we kind of rolled our meetup into that uh, around march mm-hmm. uh and then everything went virtual so we're still doing virtual meetups oh cool uh but we haven't gone back to the in-person one yet. what is the like format for that what is that like for someone that joins yeah so it's actually kind of cool you know it, we can bring in speakers from all over the country now because it's virtual so we'll bring in you know i think uh coming up we're doing one with uh somebody who's uh skilled with dsts you know the delaware statutory trust yeah yeah um and then, you know, they'll present and they'll answer some questions. Then we go into breakout rooms. So you still kind of get that networking aspect. Oh, really? You yeah. can break it out on Zoom? Yeah. Yeah. You can. And you just kind of randomize it and do it a couple of times. So. That's cool. I've always wondered how that would work with online networking events. Yeah. It's like you just like, you know, poke Matt like, hey, let's go talk <laughs> in a separate chat or something. Yeah. I don't know if like individuals can do it. I haven't seen that, but like, we'll, you know, say, Hey, you know, now we'll do breakout rooms and you can set the size and just everybody. We should do that out. with our, uh, cause we do four calls a week with our brokerage. We should maybe consider doing that and like have people branch off into groups and talk about what's working. Yeah. yeah. What do y'all use zoom? Yeah. Zoom. And it's nice because especially on like webinars and meetups and stuff, I don't know about you guys, but, uh, people are, go to so many now that like getting people to a virtual meetup is tough anyways but then they get there and it's like you know the camera's off and you don't even know if they're listening or you know Mm -hmm. you know making dinner in the back so it kind of gets people more involved and brings back the networking aspect which is nice 
Yeah, we should try that. Always yeah. learning, man. There you go. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, we'll support you any way we can. You guys, reach out to Nick, and uh, I'm super excited. Probably gonna own ten thousand units pretty soon. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. This yeah, man. Fun. Thank yeah. you for coming. Yeah, of course.